morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, welcome, uh, especially to those of you who are worshiping with us online. We're thank you, thankful you can uh, join us in this way. Um, we're happy to have you worshiping with us uh, this morning. Obviously, there'll be a few adjustments uh, to our usual order of service. We won't be collecting an offering uh, this morning, um, but uh, trust that we'll, obviously we'll resume that uh, next week as usual. Also, I've been told to encourage folks to sit closer, uh, if you can. Um, Uh, if you can, and the, and, the, and the reason is because uh, we want singing to be heard on the, on the microphones that are hanging from down front. So uh, if you're willing to do that, that'd be a big help. Uh, and also an encouragement to everyone to sing nice and, and loud. So uh, thank you guys again for being here. Those of you who can be here in person uh, for the sake of our worship together, but also for the encouragement of folks who can't be here. Um, I trust you have an order of worship. I'll ask you now if you would please rise. And our, our call to worship is from Philippians uh, chapters 3 and 4, an encouragement to rejoice uh, in the Lord. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Please turn with me in your hymnal to hymn number 363. Hymn 363, we'll begin our worship this morning uh, singing together, We Gather Together, hymn 363. Father in heaven, we have gathered here uh, to find our joy in you. Lord, we, we turn uh, now this morning away from uh, the distractions of the world and uh, the wonders of a beautiful world that you've made and the, the beauty of the snow, and the wonders of creation and all the many good gifts you've given us. We turn now, Lord, our hearts and our thoughts to you to find our greatest joy, our, our fulfillment, our, our satisfaction in Christ and in Christ alone, Lord, we pray you'd meet us in this time of worship, though we are uh, scattered across the distances. We, we pray, Lord, that you might unite our hearts together as one uh, with each other and one in, in you. Lord, help us to find our happiness, our, our hope, our all in all in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Father, it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing and turn with me now in your hymnal to him 309. In 309, and we'll sing together, I Rejoice, the Lord is King.
you may be seated. And uh, uh, this Sunday is a Sunday we traditionally recognize as Pro-Life Sunday. So we want to have a moment of prayer uh, this morning, particularly for the sick, for the infirmed, for the elderly, and for the unborn. So join with me in our time of prayer together. Lord in heaven, creator, maker, giver of life, you who formed and fashioned us within the womb, we do uh, come to you now as the great, the great healer, the great physician, and we appeal to you on behalf of the, uh, of the sick, uh, of, the, of the many who have been struggling not only with this virus, but with many viruses, the many sicknesses and colds and flus and illnesses and pains and our people are suffering and we, we ask for your mercy. We pray for health. We pray for grace, for, for encouragement, for all those who are laid aside. Lord, we pray that you would minister to them well and that you would minister to them uh, through us. Help us to be uh, thoughtful and, and considerate uh, of those who might need help with meals or with groceries or a phone call. Lord, we, we, we pray for them. We pray for the weak, for those who are weak by virtue of age or perhaps for other reasons. And we ask for your mercy. Our souls and bodies are so intertwined, Lord, that when our, our bodies are in pain, uh, our spirits uh, experience it. That when our bodies are weak, Lord, it's difficult to to concentrate, to focus on you, to be hopeful and, and positive. And so, Lord, we, we, we plead especially this morning for those who are feeling their weakness, whether it's in uh, facing great temptations or making big decisions or, or simply trying to accomplish the, the, the normal task of the day. Lord, we pray that you might be there and our strength and our health and our encouragement. Uh, Lord, we, we pray particularly for the elderly, for the aged, for those who, who feel their, their bodies uh, wearing out. The inner man is renewed day by day, but the outer man uh, seems to be wasting away. And we, we pray for those who, who struggle, uh, being able to sleep at night, for those who are, don't have the strength they once had, those who can't complete the task that they used to handle easily. Lord, we, we pray for, for our older members and all the challenges uh, that often accompany uh, old age, advanced age. And we we, we thank you for them. We respect them. We love them and pray, Lord, that you would encourage them and help them. And we pray this morning also for the unborn. We're thankful for uh, recent developments. We pray for our Supreme Court. Uh, we pray, Lord, that there would be a growing appreciation uh, for children, uh, for the gift of life, and, and a growing appreciation for, for life within the womb. And we, we, we plead for that and we pray for that, that we'll be a a people and a nation that cherishes and, and promotes and protects life. And so, Lord, we, we pray. We pray for all those in this world who are vulnerable, those who are weak, those who might be exposed to the elements, those who are uh, at the mercy of others, those who are exposed to injustice, Lord. We, we plead. We, we pray. We pray for safety, for deliverance, for care. And we pray, Lord, that we might be a, a one of the means toward that end, that you would use us as vessels of compassion, as, as protectors of life. Help us, O oh Lord, to be wise and, and gracious, to be sacrificial. Lord, use your people to preserve and promote life in this country and in our culture. We do pray. We come. We feel helpless at times. There's much that we cannot do, but we cast these cares and concerns upon you and pray, Lord, that you might, you might use us, that you might hear our cries, that hear our prayers, hear our voices, O oh Lord, and, and care for these uh, whom you love and hold so dear. For you are the good shepherd and you carry the, the nursing you and you carry the, the baby lamb. Lord, you love and care for us, your people. And so we do pray, Lord, for those who are ill, for those who are laid aside, for those who are grieving, for those who are feeling the pain and the sting of, of loss, and as well as those who are celebrating uh, birth and the gifts of new children and grandchildren. And we come, O oh Lord, together on their behalf, and we ask your blessing, and we pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I ask you if you would, uh, please now turn with me in your Bible to the book of Acts. Um, Acts chapter 21, uh, beginning with verse 7. Uh, this is our New Testament reading this morning. I'm going to begin Acts chapter 21 uh, with verse 7. Let's hear God's word. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus, and we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for one day. On the next day, we departed and came to Caesarea, and we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. While we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea, and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and bound his own feet and hands and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, This is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people there urged him not to go up to Jerusalem. But then Paul answered, What are you doing? Weeping and breaking my heart, for I'm ready not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And since he would not be persuaded, we ceased and said, let the will of the Lord be done. After these days, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us, bringing us to the house of Nansen of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we should lodge. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? They're all zealous for the law. And they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so they may shave their heads. Thus all will know that there is nothing in what they've been told about you, but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who believed, we've sent a letter with our judgment that they should abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took the man, and the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law in this place. Moreover, he even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him in the city, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple. Then all the city was stirred up, and the people ran together. They seized Paul and dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. And as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune of the cohort that all Jerusalem was in confusion. He at once took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the tribune came up and arrested him and had ordered him to be bound with two chains. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd were shouting one thing, some another, and as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. And when he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, Away with him. And then dropping down to chapter 23... Picking up with verse 12. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We've strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we've killed Paul. Now therefore, you along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to ex determine his case more exactly and we're ready to kill him before he comes near. Now, the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to say to you. 
The tribune took him by the hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is it that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they're going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they've killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent. So the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one that you've informed me of these things. And then he called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. And we'll end uh, the reading there. Uh, thus far, uh, the reading of God's word. I'll ask you now if you would uh, please stand and turn with me this time in your hymnal to hymn number 348. As we uh, prepare to come to uh, the reading and the preaching of God's word, we'll sing together hymn uh, 348. Jesus uh, with thy church abide. Let's stand and we'll sing together.
be seated. I'll ask you now to turn with me in your Bible to a couple of passages. Uh, first of all, in the book of Philippians, uh, Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 uh, to 18. We're actually working our way together uh, through the book of Romans under the heading Good News uh, for the World. But I want to begin, first of all, by reading from the book of Philippians chapter 1, beginning with verse 12. Again, this is God's word. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. And then if you keep that place marked and turn with me to our primary text this morning, the book of Romans, uh, Romans chapter 15, uh, picking up where we left off last time with verse 30. Uh, This morning, we want to consider working together in joy and fellowship. Again, this will be our primary passage this morning, Romans chapter 15, uh, beginning with verse 30, again, This is God's word. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. The reading of God's word, may the Lord add his blessing to it. Let's pray together. Uh, Lord in heaven, we do pray now that your word would accomplish its work within us. We pray for those who are here physically, but also those who are worshiping with us online. And we pray that you would remove the the distractions and the interruptions and help us to bring our, our mind and our thoughts to bear upon this portion of your word. We pray that you would speak to us Clearly that you would uh, illumine the text for us. That you would enable us to to, to see and to comprehend exactly what you're saying and and how it applies to us. We pray, Lord, that your word would would convict us. It would challenge us. It would instruct us. It would encourage us. It would would comfort us. It would lead us to our knees and and lead us to the foot of the cross. We pray that your word would lead us uh, by the hand, as it were, to the feet of Jesus. And Lord, we pray ultimately that your word would bring us peace. Lord, we pray these things and seek your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, We've been talking about uh, the new year and and plans for the new year. And the last few weeks I've been trying to encourage you to have some idea of priorities for the new year. Some idea of the things that you want and need to accomplish in the new year. In particular... Uh, Last week we talked about the importance of uh, fellowship and and service. That we need to prioritize and plan times of fellowship and and service. Typically, uh, when we talk about goals and priorities and plans, especially this time of year, we often think uh, primarily in terms of individual goals and plans. New Year's resolutions and such, you know. Maybe you hope to, to lose some weight or get in shape. or you, you know, Often we have individual goals for the new year, and that's, that's fine. That's all well and good. But uh, this morning, I, I want us to think particularly about plans, not just for yourself and your family, but for us as a church family, as a congregation. And I want to encourage us all uh, this morning, uh, let us work together in joy and fellowship. Uh, You remember uh, where we left off. The Apostle Paul is in the city of Corinth, but he's writing to Christians in Rome. And it is his heart's desire to to visit the congregation in Rome. Uh, We saw last week that for years he has been pleading and praying that somehow he could get to visit these Christians in Rome. But thus far, every effort, every plan has been thwarted. But now at last, 
Paul is hopeful that he's finally going to make it to Rome. He is looking forward to coming to Rome and enjoying a, a sweet time of fellowship together, mutually encouraged in the faith. And then uh, he is hoping that the church in Rome will not only welcome him and provide hospitality and room and board and, and be receptive to his ministry, but he's also hoping that the church in Rome is going to help him on his way as he seeks to take the gospel uh, to Spain. But first, but before, before Paul can leave and go west to Rome and then to Spain, first he needs to go east to Jerusalem. He has been uh, collecting relief funds uh, from the churches of Macedonia and Achaia, from the Greek churches, to help provide some measure of relief for the Jewish Christians in, in Jerusalem that are suffering uh, a famine. And so first Paul has to go east to Jerusalem, deliver this gift to the Jerusalem church, and then he hopes to go to Rome, and then from Rome to take the gospel to Spain. And that's where we pick up this morning, Romans chapter 15 with verse 30. He's writing to those Christians in Rome, and he says, I appeal to you, brothers. Now remember that Paul himself at this point had never been to Rome, so most of these Christians he hasn't, he hasn't yet met. A few of them he has, some he knows by name, but most of them he's never actually met, and yet he feels this kinship, this this connection with these believers, so much so that he's been pleading and praying for them for years. We saw that back in chapter 1. He says, as God is my witness, I remember you regularly in my prayers. And he's been praying for years to be able to come see them. And now here this morning, he refers to them as brothers, my kinsmen. Even though he's never met most of them, he, he feels this kinship in the Lord. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he hasn't met most of these Christians, he says, we have this in common. We have the same Lord. We have the same king. We're not just part of the same family. We're, we're part of the same uh, kingdom. And, and so Paul is emphasizing uh, our commonality, what we have in common, what brings us together. We've already seen that there was a lot of diversity uh, in, the, in the church in Rome, that most of the Christians in Rome were Greek. That is, they have been rescued out of paganism, out of idolatry, and out of uh, immorality. Most of them have experienced radical conversions. And so they see Christianity as something new and, and exciting. And yet there was also a, a minority in the Christian church in Rome of, of Jewish Christians who, who looked at the faith quite differently. In their minds, Christianity wasn't something new. It went back, it was the faith of their fathers. It went back at least to, to Abraham. They had been raised in the faith. And, and for the Jewish Christians, of course, they were very committed to the Jewish festivals and the ceremonial law and the dietary restrictions and so there was great diversity within the church in Rome but not only is there diversity within the church but also they're very different from Paul I mean Paul had few peers I mean who who was quite like Paul and yet and yet Paul sees them as brothers he sees this connection this kinship even though they're divided by many many miles and he's never actually seen most of them uh, in person they had the same Lord he said we have this in common our common Lord Jesus Christ we have the same king and so he says I appeal to you brothers by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the spirit well, it's true that the Holy Spirit uh, loves his people. Uh, the Holy Spirit loves you. Uh, but here, I think Paul is speaking of that love that the Holy Spirit engenders uh, among us for one another. He's saying, I'm appealing to you. Even, even though we're divided by great distance, we've never actually met. We're, we're brothers and sisters in the Lord. We have this kinship in Christ. We have the same Lord, the same King. And, and the Holy Spirit has given us this love for each other. And so he says, I appeal to you. Brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me. Okay, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, we as the people of God should strive together. And of course the word strive means to struggle, to wrestle, to, to labor, to, to work. The idea is that as God's people, we need to work together. As God's people, we can accomplish much more together than any of us could accomplish individually. Well, I already mentioned that Paul is anticipating that the Roman Christians will work with him when he arrives in Rome. He's anticipating that, that, that they're going to welcome him, they'll provide hospitality, that they'll, uh, they'll be receptive to his ministry, that there'll be mutual encouragement. Paul's going to preach to them. Paul says, I, I want to give a spiritual gift to you. I want to proclaim the gospel in Rome. But he's also anticipating that they're going to welcome him, that they're going to bless him. He's going to enjoy fellowship. 
that they're going to replenish his supplies and they're going to provide whatever he needs to take the gospel to Spain. Paul is already assuming that they're going to join him in that ministry, that they will provide whatever supplies he needs, but also travel companions or guides or translators, or that they're going to go with him, in a sense, and help him in taking the gospel of Spain. Paul is assuming that kind of cooperation, that partnership in the gospel. But he's not willing to wait until he gets to Rome uh, for those Christians to work alongside of him, to work with him. He wants them to begin uh, working with him now. And that's what we see in our text this morning. He says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers. In your prayers, that is, even though we're separated by distance, you can join with me and and work with me and struggle and strive with me in, in prayer. There are many things in life uh, that we can't do, obviously. Uh, We can't uh, save ourselves. We can't forgive ourselves. We can't undo our past. We can't change our hearts. We can't fix ourselves. We can't fix other people. We can't convert other people. We can't change a lot of circumstances. There's a lot of things in life that we can't do, and, and so we look to God to do the work. Lord, help. Lord, forgive me. Lord, Lord, save me. There's lots of things in life we can't do, and so we turn to the Lord and we ask God to do it. We look to God to do it. In in that sense, in that sense, prayer is not work. (laughs) Prayer is the opposite of work. Prayer is asking God to do the work. You know, Uh, prayer certainly isn't a saving work. We can't say, well, I'm I'm going to heaven because I, I pray a lot, or I'm going to heaven because I have prayed the prayer. Prayer is not a saving work. It's, it's not something we do to earn our salvation. Prayer is an acknowledgement that I can't do the work. I can't fulfill God's law the way I'm supposed to. I can't undo my past. I can't save myself. Prayer is asking God to do it. In that sense, prayer is the opposite of work. Prayer is simply asking God to do the work. In that sense, prayer is easy. It's the very opposite of work. But in another sense, prayer is work. If you're talking about regular uh, consistent, uh, daily, meaningful, uh, lengthy prayer. It is work. Uh, the word Paul uses this morning is strive. Now, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. To strive again is to struggle, to, to wrestle, to, to, to labor. Uh, Isaiah uh, describes prayer as taking hold of God. Uh, Jacob, of course, wrestled with the angel of the Lord. Sometimes Paul uses the image of prayer as, as struggling or striving or, or wrestling. But the idea is of, of effort uh, against difficulty. In that sense, prayer is work. Prayer is work. It takes energy. It takes effort. It takes focus. It takes concentration. It doesn't come easy. Well, obviously, in some sense, prayer can be easy. Help, Lord. Uh, that's easy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, forgive me. I mean, in one sense, prayer is the essence of easy. But if you're talking about regular, disciplined, focused, uh, consistent, concentrated prayer, that takes energy and effort. Everything in the old man resists prayer. Everything in the flesh resists consciously coming in the presence of God, remembering who God is, humbling ourselves and remembering who we are. Everything within the old nature re- resists that. And so not only is there resistance within, but there's also resistance without. There's also distra- distractions and responsibilities and, and needs and, and phone calls and things happening so that so much in life conspires to make prayer, consistent prayer, difficult, if not impossible. And if we're to have the kind of prayer life that the Apostle Paul is calling us to, it's going to take effort. It's going to take struggle. It's going to take work. In that sense, prayer is work. Prayer is a significant means by which we strive together for the gospel. That's what Paul is saying here. I appeal to you, brothers. I'm asking you. I'm pleading with you. I'm begging you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. Now, you remember that, the, obviously, the, the Christian church in Jerusalem was almost entirely Jewish. Um, and, and some of those Christians had mixed feelings about Paul and his ministry. There was a lots of rumors going around, a lot of false accusations. And so even a lot of the good Jewish Christians weren't quite sure what to think of Paul. But in addition, there are also people we call Judaizers, 
who professed faith in Christ but still believed it was necessary to be uh, circumcised in order to be saved. And the Judaizers were quite critical of Paul and his ministry. And then on top of that, there are these men that Paul is referring to here, unbelievers in Judea. These are Jewish people who are not really believers at all who did not want to see, want to see Paul's uh, mission or ministry succeed. In fact, there were many who wanted to see Paul put to death and would have been happy to cooperate in that. And so Paul is saying, please pray for me that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. He's not just saying, hey, remember me. If you happen to think of me when you're praying, throw up a prayer for me, you know, light a candle for me. He's saying, he's asking them, he's pleading that, that they will wrestle in prayer daily, perhaps throughout the day, that God would preserve Paul's life. Paul is aware that by, by taking this gift to Jerusalem, he's taking his life in his hands. He's, he's risking his life. And so he's pleading with these Christians in Rome, please join me in this struggle and please pray, strive in prayer for me that God will spare me. And, and Paul is not being overly cautious or paranoid. In fact, you know, often when we go on a trip, you can't always get a direct flight somewhere. You have to sort of make a connection. Well, in the same way as Paul is going to leave Corinth, um, it was rare to find a ship that would go directly from Corinth to Jerusalem. More likely, Paul would have to take a ship that would go to another harbor. Then that might take him to another harbor. And then at that harbor, he might have to change ships to another one. And so, uh, as Paul prepared to go to Jerusalem, his, his first leg of his journey was going to be to Syria. A, tr a ship to Syria. Well, before he got on board, he discovered that there was a, a plot from these men to put Paul to death. So, that very first leg of his trip had to change. So, Paul's not being paranoid here. There really were men who wanted to put him to death. And so, he says, please, please join me and strive together with me in your prayers that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. So Paul is not just praying for himself and his own personal safety, but he also asks for prayer that his ministry in Jerusalem would be successful. Okay, remember the, the saints, the believers in Jerusalem are suffering because of this famine. And so it's important that Paul be able to arrive there safely to deliver these relief funds. But not only that, Paul sees this as an important opportunity to unite the church. If, if, the, if the Jewish church in Jerusalem, the mother church, is willing to accept these gifts from these Greek churches, these churches that are most, almost entirely non-Jewish, they're Gentile, then that would be a, a tacit acknowledgement of, of, of the Greek Christians as real Christians, as, as brothers in the Lord. And, and, and Paul sees this as a potential turning point in uniting uh, the whole church, the early Christian church, and, a, and a, an opportunity to, to see approval, a stamp of approval on, on Paul's ministry. But... While there was much to be gained, there was also much potential for loss because suppose his ministry to Jerusalem was not accepted. I mean, these are believers. They're Jewish Christians. They're believers. James was there and others, and doubtless they're going to be thankful and they're going to be grateful. But it was a complicated issue. There were a lot of rumors uh, about Paul, a lot of false accusations. And it's not hard to imagine someone like James uh, in the Jerusalem church uh, saying, you know what? We thank you, Paul. We appreciate what you've done for us. We know you mean well. We want you to send our thanks to the churches in Greece. We really appreciate their generosity, but we're just not ready to take this yet. We're not ready to accept this yet. We're not there yet. You know, there's a lot of mixed feelings. There's a lot of things going around. There's a lot we've got to work through, and you know, we don't want to offend anybody. We don't want to lose any families. It's not hard to imagine the, the elders of the church in Jerusalem saying, thanks, but we, we can't accept this gift. Not, not yet. Not, it's not hard to imagine that, but, but imagine what that would have done, how that would have been received. If, if you're in the Greek churches, if, no matter how nicely the Jerusalem leaders would have worded that, if you're a Greek Christian, you would have thought, you know what? Those, those Jewish Christians would rather starve than accept our money. That's, that's how grateful they are. That's what they think of us. They don't think we're real Christians. They don't think we're saved. If Paul's mission had failed, this could have done irreparable damage to the early Christian church. Not just dividing the Greek churches from the mother church in Jerusalem, but also the Greek churches themselves, much like the church in Rome, had some Jewish Christians in them. And how this would have affected relations within the churches could have been disastrous. And so Paul's 
says, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Okay, prayer is, is work, but it's a significant means by which we strive together for the gospel. And so even in unusual circumstances like this morning, when we can't all gather in one place to worship, we can still labor together and we can strive together in prayer. And I encourage you uh, that... Not only should we be praying for one another's health and safety as occasional prayer requests go over the prayer chain, but we should be praying for the church as a whole, for our gospel witness, for our, our opportunities. Wouldn't that be uh, so helpful and encouraging when you're witnessing to a, to a co-worker to know that the whole church is striving and struggling with you and pleading and praying for your witness and for that person? Uh, we need to be uh, struggling and striving together in prayer, uh, praying for our gospel witness, praying for our community, pray that God would use our congregation in meaningful ways. And if that doesn't excite you, if that doesn't motivate you, I know some people will come out for Bible study, but they're reticent to come out for just a prayer meeting. If the idea of prayer just doesn't strike your fancy, um, let me encourage you to pray about that. Pray about prayer. You know, pray that the Lord will give us a, a heart for prayer. It, it, often we, 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 we question whether prayer is really a good use of time. Not an occasional prayer, but, but the kind of prayer Paul is talking about is time-consuming. And, and it requires effort and, and focus. And sometimes we really do wonder, is that really my best use of time? There's so much that needs to be done. Is that really wise? Well, Paul assumes it is. And if, and if we don't believe in this sort of committed prayer, if we aren't committed to it ourselves, well, something's wrong. We need to pray about that. Pray about prayer. Pray the Lord will give us a hunger and a thirst, a commitment and a conviction and a heart uh, for prayer. Basically, this morning, what I want to do is encourage you. Let us uh, work together uh, in this new year you know, in prayer. And not just in prayer, but in joy and in fellowship. This is what Paul says. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you. Why does Paul say, so that by God's will I may come to you? Well, because God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we like. Okay, we, 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 we've already seen that, that that uh, for years now, Paul's been praying he wanted to go to Rome, and it just hasn't worked out. God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we would like. In fact, we don't know if Paul ever made it to Spain. Remember, that was the end goal. He's going to deliver this gift to Jerusalem and then go to Rome and enjoy time in Rome. And then ultimately, his hope is that the church in Rome will help him take the gospel to Spain. But we don't know uh, whether or not Paul actually made it. Uh, interestingly enough, about 30 years after this, Clement of Rome, Clement was the pastor of the church in Rome um, toward the end of the century, Clement wrote a letter to the church in Corinth in which he seems to suggest that Paul did make it to Spain. Or at least Clement believed Paul did. He says something about Paul taking the gospel to the far reaches of the western frontier, which would have been Spain. So at least we can say that Clement, uh, 30 years after this, believed that Paul made it to Spain. But we don't really have any other evidence. The evidence, therefore, is kind of inconclusive. We don't know for sure if Paul ever made it to Spain with the gospel or not. Because God doesn't always answer our prayers the way we would like. And for a lot of people, that's reason enough not to pray. I mean, if, if even Paul's prayers aren't always answered the way, the way he would hope, why, what, what, what hope do I have? And uh, I think we've all certainly experienced times when our prayers were not answered the way we'd hope. And for some people, that, again, that's excuse enough not to pray. Sometimes something painful happens, some huge disappointment, or some setback in spite of all your prayers. And sometimes our response is to harden our heart. I'm never going to let that happen again. I will never get my hopes. I'm not going to open up my, my heart and my life to God anymore in, in, in prayer. I, I'm not going to let that I don't want to get hurt again. And so sometimes uh, our response to unanswered prayer is to just refuse to pray again. I'm just not going to let that happen again. And we become 
bitter and, and soured uh, toward God. Because he doesn't always answer our prayers the way we would like. And Paul knew that, and yet that did not keep Paul from believing in prayer, even though he has been praying for years to get to Rome and it hasn't happened yet. Nevertheless, he believes in prayer and is pleading uh, with these brothers to pray with and for him. And the fact is, these things that Paul is requesting, these prayers uh, were answered in a positive way. You know, we often... um, we, we often forget the many times God does answer our prayers. We, we remember and we hold on to those, those moments of disappointment and we dwell on them. We're, we're quick to remember these prayers that didn't go answered the way we'd hoped. But we, we're quick to forget all the many times, day after day after day, that God does answer our prayers in a positive way. Uh, here are several examples right in our passage. Paul's first prayer request was, to plead and pray that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. Well, that happened. That's what we read about earlier in, in the book of, the book of Acts. When, when Paul went to Jerusalem, before he got there, he stopped in the home of Philip the Evangelist. Um, a prophet named Agabus came down from Jerusalem and took Paul's belt and bound his, his wrists and his feet and said, uh, in, in this way, uh, so the Jews are going to bind you and turn you over to the Gentiles. You know, he basically said, this is what the Holy Spirit says, Paul. The Jewish people are going to capture you and bind you and turn you over to the Romans. And you know what that could easily mean? Well, it could mean death. Because that's certainly what it meant. I mean, our Lord Jesus Christ was, was bound by the religious leaders, the Jewish people uh, of, the, of Jerusalem. And they, what did they do? They falsely accused him and they, and they turned him over to the Romans so that he was mocked and scourged and beaten and ultimately uh, crucified. And so this prophet Agabus is telling Paul, Paul, you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be captured and it, it could mean your death. And Paul's response was, I'm ready. Not only to be in prison, but even to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord, if that's what it takes. He was so convinced that this was his calling to take this gift to Jerusalem. He was willing to to risk his life. And he almost lost his life. Again, we read that earlier in uh, Acts 21, that when Paul was in the temple, someone saw him there. Paul wasn't doing anything wrong. But earlier in the week, Paul had been seen with somebody uh, who was a Gentile, who was not Jewish. And so when they saw him in the temple, they assumed he brought that guy with him into the temple. And they started making all kinds of accusations about Paul. This is Paul, the man who, who was teaching against God's law. And there was, there was such a tumult. Uh, they said they, the crowd began to beat Paul and he almost lost his life. We read about kind of at the last minute, uh, the tribune, who was a high-ranking uh, officer in, in Rome, uh, sent soldiers and they rescued Paul. In fact, that's what it says. It says, um, Paul was actually... Acts 21, 35. Paul was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. That's an answer to this prayer. that God sent Roman soldiers to rescue Paul at at the last minute. And it happened not once, but it happened repeatedly. Because once the Romans had had arrested Paul, they weren't sure what to do with him. I mean, what exactly was he accused of? It just sounded like a religious dispute to them. And so they sent Paul to be examined by the religious council. And then he came back. And then uh, we also read this. We read about how uh, 40 Jewish men uh, made a vow that they were not going to eat or drink until they had put Paul to death. And so those 40 Jewish men went to the religious council and they said, look, ask the Romans if you can examine Paul again. And when Paul's on the way, we'll ambush him and we'll kill him. But fortunately, Paul had a sister. Who knew the apostle Paul had a sister? But Paul had a sister and she had a son. So Paul's nephew somehow heard about this plot and he went to the, to the tribune and, and told him what was going on. And, and this is what we read. Again, this is Acts uh, 21. So the tribune called two of the centurions and said, get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and, and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. So God provided 200 spearmen and 70 horsemen and and, and all these Romans. In the middle of the night, they they whisked Paul away to safety. That's an answer to this prayer. That was Paul's first prayer request. That he be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. That prayer was answered. The second prayer request. 
that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That prayer was also answered in a positive way. We read this morning, um, and this was Luke speaking. He says, when we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. Well, who knew how they were, the Jewish Christians were going to receive Paul and Luke and the others? They could have been very skeptical. They could have had all kinds of reservations. No. He says, when we came to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And after greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. So when, when, when Paul met with the leaders of the Jerusalem church, they weren't critical. They weren't fault-finding. They weren't making accusations. They listened attentively with Paul told about how God was converting these people who weren't Jewish. And they praised the Lord. They glorified God. And that's an answer, another answer to Paul's prayer request. This is what Paul says. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf. Uh, number one, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. That's the first request. That was answered. Uh, number two, that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That's the second request. That was answered. So that by God's will I may come to you with joy. Why does, why does Paul say, uh, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy? Well, again, because for years Paul's been praying to get to Rome. He's been planning, but it hasn't worked out. It hasn't been God's will. And, and we saw this last time that Paul is almost saying, you know, it's almost like I guess I could have made up my mind that I'm going to come to Rome no matter what God wants. But that wouldn't have been God's will. That wouldn't have been with his blessing. So we saw last time Paul said back in verse 29, I know that when I finally do come to you, I'll come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. There's this enormous joy and blessing that comes from knowing and, and doing the will of God, that you're doing what, what God wants. As long as Paul felt God didn't, had something else for him to do, he wasn't going to go to Rome as much as he wanted to. But he says, when I finally do go, it'll be because that's what you want me, God wants me to do, and I'll come with the, in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. And likewise, now in our text this morning, he says, pray that by God's will I may come to you with, with joy. There's just enormous joy that comes from knowing and, and, and doing the will of God. Yes, uh, sometimes God doesn't answer our prayers uh, the way we'd like, but that's a good thing because we don't always know what to pray for. We don't always know what to ask for, and God knows what's best, and so we praise him. Thank God that, that he doesn't always give us what we ask for, but what a, what a joy that comes from knowing that you know, the Lord's will be done. That's why when we pray, we say, Lord, if it's your will, we say the Lord's will be done because, because we know God knows what's best. But there's this great joy that comes knowing and doing uh, God's will. He says, pray this, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea. Yep, that was answered. That my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. Yes, that was answered. And thirdly, that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. That prayer request is answered as well. Not exactly the way Paul had intended. Paul didn't know he'd be getting there as a prisoner, but God answered that prayer. Paul got to Rome. It was about two years later than he had hoped, uh, but it didn't cost him a dime uh, because he went on a Roman ship as a prisoner. But it really wasn't an answer to that prayer. Uh, look what Paul says. That by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. That's what he's asking. Not only that he can finally get to Rome, but that he can get there with joy and be refreshed with the saints. And that's exactly what happened. If you want to keep this place marked and flip over to that passage we read in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1.12, Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. In other words, I don't, think, I don't want you to think that this is a disappointment, like God isn't answering my prayers. He says, I, this is fantastic. This is a wonderful answer to prayer. I want you to know, brothers, what happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. He says, this is a wonderful thing. Remember, Paul had said, I want to come to Rome to preach the gospel. And he said, what a blessing, what an answer to prayer that, that God has worked it out so that I, I came as a prisoner so all the guards know that I'm there because of Christ and it's opened all kind of doors of witnessing for me. And he says, most of the brothers, meaning the, the brothers in Rome, 
the Christians in Rome, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. You know, from a distance, it might have looked like an unanswered prayer. But no, those Christians who were there in in Rome saw, this is a wonderful answer to prayer. They saw how God was using Paul in his imprisonment. And so the Christians in Rome, they became more bold and confident in in witnessing as well. Well, Verses 15 and following, Paul goes on to say, granted, some people preach for the wrong reasons, the wrong motives. But then verse 18, he says, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that, I rejoice. I rejoice. Well, that was his third prayer request, that he be able to come to, to Rome by God's will and to come, to come with joy. And, and it was in Rome that he wrote this letter to the Philippians, and, and, and the Philippian letter is the most joyful book in the whole New Testament. Uh, again, our call to worship this morning. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Re- rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say rejoice. Eight or nine times in the book of Philippians, Paul talks about joy and, and, and rejoicing. In fact, it's in Philippians 4 where he says, I've learned the secret to being content. And he doesn't mean just, well, I've accepted that God doesn't always answer my prayer. He means I've learned the secret to being happy, truly contented, satisfied, joyful. That's an answer to the prayer in our text this morning. He had prayed that he could come by God's will to the Roman with joy, and he did. And finally, our passage ends uh, with verse 33. May the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Now, we know that, of course, the chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. They were given much later just to help us so that we can all be on the same passage, same, same page, looking at the same passage. Uh, there are a number of scholars who believe that verse 33 really shouldn't be considered the end of this section, but that it should be considered the beginning of the next section, you know, the beginning of chapter 16, as it were, because they believe that, that may the God of peace be with you all is sort of like a, a benediction. It's a, it's a beginning of the conclusion of the whole book, in, in which case uh, Paul is making the point that God has made peace with his people. Christ lived, died, and rose again that we might have peace with God. If you think about the whole message of the book of Romans, uh, it's all about how God has made uh, peace with us. Think of Romans uh, 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God uh, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, If prayer is asking God to do the work, well, Christ did the work. Christ fulfilled the law. He lived the the perfect life. He lived the the life that we didn't live, uh, that act of obedience of Christ. And and he died, the the passive obedience of Christ, the things he suffered. He died in our place as our substitute, as our sin bearer. Christ lived and died and he rose again so we might have peace with God, so we wouldn't have this conflict with God. And it's, it's not so much that God saves us from our anger, toward God but that God saves us from his anger toward us we're we're sinful and fallen and inwardly corrupt and God has every reason to hold his wrath against us but he has he has instead sent his son to to propitiate his wrath to satisfy his wrath and he has made peace with us and so if indeed verse 33 is really the beginning of the conclusion to the whole book then that's what Paul is emphasizing here that that Christ lived and died and rose again, that we might have peace with God. But uh, I would agree with most scholars that uh, verse 33 really is um, the conclusion of the passage we've been looking at, in which case the peace that Paul is talking about is, is not so much the objective peace between us and God, but the sense of peace, the feeling of it, the experience of peace. Um, what Paul told the, called in the Philippians uh, the, the peace that passes all understanding, that, that peace that comes from knowing that, that God's plans will be accomplished. That's what Paul's been talking about. He's been talking about his plans and, and this sense of peace, that knowing that God's will will be done, that God's purposes will be accomplished, that, that because he has made peace with us through Jesus Christ, we can experience a sense of peace that God is good, that God is in control. Whether he answers our prayers exactly the way we'd hope or not, we can experience peace. God is good. Uh, He is on the throne. He is our king. 
He has poured out his spirit on us and he gives us this sense of peace. We don't know exactly what the new year is going to bring. We don't know uh, what the weather is going to do. We don't know where the pandemic is going to go. But we know that God will carry out his good purposes. And then he does that in, at least in large part, through his church. And so let us, let us work together this new year. Let's strive together. Let's join arm in arm and work together in joy and fellowship. Let's pray together. Lord in heaven, we're thankful for your word. Uh, it is rich. We pray that you might give us a heart of prayer. We pray, Lord, that we might join arm in arm with one another and commit ourselves to, to fellowship and, and, and service together, that we would prioritize that and that you would mobilize us as your people and that we would support one another in prayer as, the, as, as Paul sought the, sought the prayer of support of the, of the church in Rome. Lord, help us to, to work together, to labor together, to strive together for the advancement of the gospel uh, in our part of the world. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you would, uh, turn with me in your hymnal to our closing hymn, uh, hymn number 355. And we'll sing together, We Are God's People. Let's stand, we'll sing together hymn 355.
receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you, give you peace. Amen.